This is Beyond the Uniform with TJ Brassel. And welcome into the next episode of Beyond the Uniform. I'm TJ Brassel, and joining me is world silver medalist Raven Rogers. Raven, thank you for coming on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right. So I say world silver medalist. That's still pretty fresh. How does yeah. that feel being introduced as world silver medalist Raven Rogers? Uh, I've been thinking about that because um, I know it's going to come a lot this year coming up. It's It's been, I don't know, it still hasn't dawned on me. I feel like it's an accomplishment that I'm glad to kind of have under my name. Because, you know, once you're a rookie, like, once you're in the professional world, they don't really know how to introduce you. Like, so sometimes some, like, um, I don't know, commentators, whatever, they'll introduce you as, like, something you did from like world youths or something like a long time ago or like in season it's like once you get overseas not everybody really knows how in season is <laughs> and so you have all these accolades from like the past and so it's kind of good and kind of like refreshing to have something that's a little bit more respected um under my name it's like a little bit more familiar with but um it's a little bit refreshing but i'm lo- definitely looking forward to um some more some bigger accomplishments Absolutely. Well, World yeah. World Silver Medalist is definitely a definitely a good title to have so far. But mm-hmm. um, so let's let's revisit that race for a second. Okay. Coming into that that last home stretch, when you're wa- when you're watching on the screen, like you're not even in screen. You're uh-huh. you're a ways back, and you just came on strong at the end. And honestly, if there was five ten meters left, like you might we might be introducing you as World Gold Medalist Raven right. Rogers. So, what was that race plan going into the race? Um, it's funny because when everyone talks about their race, they say, they, they say the same thing. Um, the race plan was just more so to, um, I didn't want to like fall into the hype because I understand like it's a final and usually like it gets a little crazy. Um, and so I just wanted to really like trust myself and trust kind of what I had already thought into before I went into the race, which is just more so, um, Like, when I ran there in May, I was explaining in some videos how, like, I completely died when I came off of the curve. So I was like, oh, I don't want to do that again. I know that this track is definitely different than all the other tracks I've run in, you know, after May. Um, And so I wanted to take that experience and kind of learn from it and use it in the final. Um, Especially through the semis, you could tell just watching other races, people were like, had to hit another gear at the 50. So it was definitely a little bit more supporting my case and my strategy going into the race based off of how the track was made. So I just wanted to not fall into the hype and just really trust myself and kind of not sell myself short. That totally makes sense. But okay, so you say the track is different, but when you when you think about it, like every track's four hundred meters. So what makes uh, one track so different from the other? Well, what makes it different, yes, every every track is four hundred meters. But also what makes it different is like sometimes um the material. So if it's like a mondo track, usually like mondo tracks are known to be faster tracks. So that makes okay. a difference, but also the way this one was structured is kind of the more generic difference is if curves are longer or shorter and then the straights are shorter. So it all equals to 400 meters, but it's like a different combination of ways that it could equal to 400 meters. So like this track had, the curves weren't as long, but the straights were like drastically long, especially the home stretch. It was like 110 meters. Like it was drastically long. And so I knew that, um, I knew that that straight was enough to really make, you know, you can, you could definitely catch somebody with the straight. So when I went, I was like, you know, I'm going to just go. And I know I'm going to catch some people because the straight is long enough. I didn't expect to get so close to, you know, the front. That's why at the end, I'm like, oh, I wasn't even that far, you know. (laughs) But that, you know, the track is, the straightaway was really long. Okay, that makes sense. That makes total sense. All right, so that was your first senior world championships where you're repping the usa you you've repped the usa before but those are the first senior world championships what well, was that like because i did i did uh indoors world indoors sorry first yeah. outdoor world championship. Yeah. so what what was it like repping usa's at the outdoors um being there amongst the group of like other athletes it was definitely um an experience just to be amongst so many 
people who have already kind of said their names. And when you're when you're amongst the group, you kind of you kind of just see them for who they are. You kind of forget about the accolades that they've already accomplished. And so um, a lot of them were had leadership qualities to where, you know, even when we'd be gathering each night for each final um, we'd gather into like the big room and be watching everyone's races and semis and be cheering. It was an experience that will last forever um, because it was just like just to be in that room and be there and um, e watching everyone's races. It was just something that, you know, everybody should be able to experience. That's awesome. And yeah. you, so you talked about getting to know uh, other athletes. Mm -hmm. So when we had Devin on, we were talking kind of a little bit about the same thing. And he mentioned uh, how his girlfriend Morgan and you have gotten to know each other a little bit. So what's it like getting to know athletes that you're com from other countries that you're competing against? Because you still have to compete against them. But it seems like after the race, so many people still have such a good bond. Right. Um, I feel like it, it just defines like the fact that it's bigger than just the competitive aspect of it. Like, granted, there are some ugly um, rivalries, you know, out there and in the past it has been. But at the end of the day, um, you know, everyone has that same, everyone shares that same track culture where there's a certain way that, you know, you kind of grow with these people. Um, as opposed to basketball and football and all these other sports, I feel like it's kind of, a little bit more spread out than track is track you know you either run summer track against these people in like club or you go to college and you see them at nc's you know like i remember at world juniors there were some people that i met and they ended up going to colleges in the u.s so it just forms it forms this like track culture that it's bigger than just the sport like we the bond essentially is a part of like what makes the culture so specific to track Okay. All right. Now, I'm assuming the next the next kind of sights you're setting is towards Tokyo. Yeah. What is it that you think you need to focus on the most heading into heading into the trials to to get to Tokyo? Um, just the same thing. I feel like like my biggest thing and my biggest advice I try to tell kind of other runners is to not fall into the hype. Because essentially, like, the hype the hype consists of, to me, is more so um, whether it's social media that is feeding into a race or feeding into an athlete that you have to compete against or however, like, that hype or you see someone's, like, accolades and it's, like, just the things that kind of market track and feel, I feel like that can become part of the hype and some people can get lost in trying to make themselves really out there instead of just focusing on what they need to do and um, executing their, their planning. And so my biggest thing is just to um, be as prepared as possible, as calm as possible, because I realized that my last two races of my season were the most calm I've ever been in my career, and those were my two best races. Um, so I just try to be as calm as possible and um, really just – you know, trust God throughout the whole way. I think that's the biggest thing for me is just like keeping my faith strong um, and just staying grounded in my faith. So what is it that you do to calm those nerves? Is it is it a lot faith based? Um, From my experience, I feel like it's it, just relative back to worlds. I feel like that was a bigger part of it because I'm used to having my family a lot of places. So to not have my mom there, at least somebody there, I kind of, um, I have my teammates and my coach, but it's not the same as having like my family or my mentor. So I kind of really had to go back to my roots and how I was grounded, which is like, I was raised with, you know, Baptist background and you kind of have this sense of like part of, you know, God is in faith is a part of you. And so just not like, you know, being all extra with it, but more so just knowing how I'm grounded and how I was like able to make it as far as I, as I, you know, am even to worlds. So just keeping those same principles and values. Um, that's more so what what I kind of take into more races to not be as frantic and spastic and everything's for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. And I know that to the best of my heart, even through experiences so I just take that into every race. 
So does this silver medal give you an added confidence boost going into trials trying to get to Tokyo? Um, the silver, the silver medal, I hate that I answer every question saying, um, I'm going to do better with that. <laughs> but I feel like, um, having the silver medal, it, it doesn't give me the added boost. It's kind of like I revisit just for NCs, like each national, you know, national win in the 800, it was great, but you kind of always have to prove yourself. Like you, okay, you went, you know, you went freshman year, you got to win again. Um, and so that's, that's the thing is. I don't, I never harp on that or depend on that. I always try to make sure I'm able to be ready for the next year um, because it's not, it's kind of like the year restarts and I have new goals and new aspirations. So I can't really harp on that too much. Like, I feel like the accolades is for everyone else to kind of see and um, for everyone else to kind of enjoy and experience. And I enjoyed it during that time, but I have so many more goals that I'm trying to accomplish that I know it's going to take you know, a, a new year and new um, progressions and accomplishments, you know, to get to where I'm going, where I want to go. That makes total sense. That makes total sense. All right. So I saw recently or semi-recently, you went back to Oregon to for a football game where you were honored. Yes. What What is that experience like going back to your well, hometown for college anyways um, and having that entire stadium honoring you? The experience was definitely one that I will cherish forever. Um, just being like, I recall in my post on Instagram posting how I remember Phyllis had came, came back, you know, after winning worlds and she was honored. So it's different when you're being honored with the team um, for your cha national championships, but when you're away and still trying to carry on like that winning legacy that Oregon kind of instilled, it, it means a little bit more because you come back and it's already this winning culture that everyone, you know, in the school is agreeing with and everyone's familiar with. So to come back away from college, it just, um, it just kind of was a more memorable moment and true to the, like a more of a reassurance that I'm, I'm still trying to carry on this legacy that I had at Oregon. So, you know, I come back and it's like, I'm trying to add to this legacy that was left there. Totally, totally. Well, I'll, I would say so far you're doing a really good job. Oh, thank um, you. I'm trying. <laughs> I also saw you did some announcing a little bit. What were, what were you doing there? It was so fun. So I got to announce the starting players. And so my grandmother, she's really particular about, like, grammar. And she doesn't like when I say so. So she watches every interview and everything. So she's like, the night before, you need to rehearse everyone's names and stuff and I'm like I'm not doing that but I ended up going over with one of the announcers like each last name phonetically spelling it out so that I could understand it because I wanted to make sure that I got it right and no moms would be mad at me <laughs> so, that but it was so much fun and it, and it adds to like as I'm getting older I'm starting to kind of consider different um paths that I more so would like to do after track um, you know, so of course I want to do product design with my art major, more things that's affiliated with art, but I've also thought about getting into commentating and broadcasting and stuff. So just practicing now was just a little, little taste to that. And it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Future co-host of Beyond the Uniform, Raven right. Rogers. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned after track and, and your art and stuff like that. So are those the kind of the things that you focus on in your downtime? Because pro athletes, once you're once you're not practicing, I mean, you you have to recover and everything. But you have a decent amount of downtime. So, are those is what kind of things do you do in your downtime? In my downtime, I love Target and I love Home Goods. Like anybody that knows me knows I'm shopping, not in a bad way. Like I just I just spend most of my time out the house amongst all the great home goods inspiration. Like, you know, that's just like, it's it's just the jack of, I'm a jack of all trades. Like I love interior design, all of that. Of course, I probably wouldn't get into it, but there's different things that I enjoy doing and going to home goods amongst all of that decor is one of them, but as well as painting, you know? And so in the meantime, lately I've worked on, 
I, it's kind of hard trying to figure out what works because even amongst the art world, everyone has a different path. So I ask someone that's successful, like a successful painter, they wouldn't be able to tell me how they became successful. They're just like, you know, they just, they just keep making, you know, they just keep making paintings and they, they eventually get to a point to where they have a portfolio and, and whatnot. But, um, I'm in the middle of trying to work on more pieces. I'm, I'm just finishing up a piece for someone and then I'm going to um, work on two more pieces for two other people. So I'm starting to develop a little bit more um, about what works for me as far as painting wise, commission wise, um, yeah, for working with other people. That's awesome. So what what's your favorite kind of art to either see or to paint? Do you have a certain like type of art that you do or just kind of just generally painting? I like abstract art. Um, I enjoy doing abstract art, working big at Oregon. Our, our painting pr professors, art teachers, they emphasized us working, like when we had a, um, a final for a painting, the minimum size was like a four by four, like four feet by four feet. So I've adapted this quality of working really big. Um, so I have a storage unit now of like, you know, a six by four. I had a three by seven. So I'm I'm used to working really big. Um, so that's you that's where I'm at in my art career, just trying to figure out how to make more big art. Okay. All <laughs> yeah. right. What's what's the favorite your favorite thing you've painted so far? My favorite thing I've painted, I recently did a piece for my um, teammate friend, sister. She uh, is getting engaged, she's getting married. And so her and her fiance, I love them both. They're both runners, um, Angel and Pat Tiernan. Okay, and okay. Um, so I, they had a photo based off of their proposal pictures and engagement pictures. And so I made this painting based off of um, their two favorite colors. And it was kind of abstracted. I'll send you a picture. It was kind of abstracted, but it still grasped the silhouette of him kissing her her forehead. Oh, so that's it's definitely awesome. one of my favorite pieces. That's really cool. That's yeah. really cool. So I actually, I saw an article, uh, this was a while back while you were still at Oregon. You had said that a goal of yours at that time was to get some of your painting in the Museum of Modern Art. Oh my, yes. <laughs> I dream big, no matter how crazy it sounds, and I will get a painting in MoMA. I don't know how, I don't know when, but it will be there. <laughs> hey, dreaming big is perfectly fine. Dreaming yeah. big is, I, I, I believe it. You dream big to, to go uh, do some good things on the track, and you've been doing that, that pretty well, so yeah, the, the sky's healthy. the limit, I'd say. <laughs> Um, so is, is art your, is art the, the main thing or is there, are there other kinds of interests that you have, uh, outside of track? Art is the main thing, but like I said, it's mainly home goods. Like I love home goods. So the tea, I don't know why I just like, I don't know, I guess being raised kind of in the South, having a homey family type experience, just having that hominess just really is a huge inspiration. I don't know. Maybe I need to talk to a counselor and figure out like why am I so attached to home <laughs> goods? <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, I just am. And so like I I recently have like taken on the project of every time I go home, because my my parents are always kind of working or something or they're tired, like every time I go back home, I'm always like buying a bunch of stuff from Target and Home Goods to add to their house to make it more homier because I'm like I told my mom I'm like this is a house it needs to be a home like and there's a difference it's a big difference and Absolutely. so even you know my financial advisor will tell you she's like why are you spending all this money at Target I'm like I'm trying to make my mom's house a home <laughs> <laughs> so I've fallen in love with really kind of helping people um and I guess it's kind of plays with art too kind of helping people get the necessities to make their living space feel more at home and that adds to like comfort and all of that so it really that's another part of me that really kind of enjoys away from the track is you know interior designing I guess okay um, 
but not to the extensiveness, just more so helping, you know, people see a vision in their space and stuff. I'm a jack of all trades, TJ. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just everywhere. <laughs> hey, that's perfectly fine. Now, you're talk- you, you were talking about loving shopping and all that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. And I had mentioned to you before, before we uh, got going here that when we were at Oregon, you had to have been probably the stylish person on the track team. Oh my god! Um, but <laughs> one thing I I really I that really sticks out in my mind is that that style that you carried over to the track you you thought was really important to you, and people talked to you about that, and you were very outspoken about why that style was so important to you. So why is that kind of the style your your own personal style so important to you on the track? I feel like it's important because I mean. Even a while ago, in one of the articles, I had mentioned something I didn't really share a lot, which was more so, like, when I was younger, um, you know, everyone has, like, that rough stage. Now, kids and kids nowadays don't have a rough stage. They're still grown. But back then, back then, you know, there was this stage in middle school where I was just trying to figure out how I wanted to look, whatever style I wanted to have. Um, and I remember just going through that and uh being good in track and then like there was some comment that was like oh like she's like a boy and I remember this comment like being young and telling my mom like this is what I heard this is what I said like is this true whatever because I was good in track and that was you know and to there was this moment being so young where I literally remember like typing in oh how to be more girly like just to really put it out there, like, I'm, I'm girly, I like this type of stuff, but because I'm good in track, it's seen as, you know, being like a boy, and it shouldn't be that way. So it goes, like, this is the end result when you see all the stylishness on the track, but it goes way further than that to when I probably wouldn't even be been able to even tie it back to now. Like, there was something deeply rooted that affected that kind of change in progress. And, um, and then... My aunt is like a diva. She she's a <laughs> diva. She won't let me. She would never let me leave with like wrinkled pants and stuff. Like she's she's a diva. All you know. So having her influence in my life, um, she really had a big influence in my life as far as like style and how to carry myself as a lady. Um, and just you know, in the South, it's a big culture to dress up. So essentially, it's kind of like I'm bringing the South everywhere I go because it's a big culture. You go to church every Sunday; everyone looks nice. It's it's a part of the culture, um, and so I feel like that's kind of taken a part of why I've been so, I guess, how I am on the track. <laughs> All right, totally, totally. Now yeah. going back to Oregon. Mm-hmm. You accomplished a lot while you were at Oregon. Triple crown, Bowerman, collegiate record. Now you've accomplished a world silver medal. Of everything you've done so far in your track career, what's your proudest moment? Proudest moment? It's so funny because everyone everyone is like, the triple crown moment was amazing. And it was. It was. It was great. But it's like my biggest moment, and I still to this day hold on to it, is winning NC's freshman year because there was this change in mentality that really made me, it was a mature decision of like a mental decision that I really grasped and bottled going from high school to college. And that transition I made up in my mind that I wanted to, I wasn't going to let anything, I wasn't going to let me being a rookie or a freshman be kind of a, um, something that restricted me from shooting and aiming for the skies, you know? And so to have accomplished what I did freshman year, that was just, I guess, the start in getting the ball rolling on um, me dreaming big and kind of expanding on that. Like, it, you never, you're not, you're not going to lose anything by dreaming big. Like, you know, if you don't achieve it, you don't achieve it. But it does help by speaking into the existence and, you know, aiming for it because at least you have something that you're working for, you know? And so that was my biggest thing um, that time is because I had to make up in my mind that I didn't want me being a freshman to be an excuse to not win NCs if that's something that I truly wrote down on paper and believed that I could do. Okay. So does having 
so did that moment kind of start almost like a domino effect of everything else of creating that confidence for you to accomplish everything you've accomplished thus far? Uh, I feel like it did, but I, I feel like just being patient, like, of course, praying about everything, having a solid foundation, a uh, su solid support system, that really contributed to the success because it's it's kind of hard when you don't have a solid support system um, or at least somebody that you can talk to. So that's been the most consistent thing without my love, within throughout my life is having a solid support system, whether that's five people or one person, you know? So from my family to having my mentor in Oregon to, you know, on to meeting my physio and people here in Philly. Um, it's, it's, it's funny, but you know, there's different, different places and there's different people that are in those places that still tie back to that support system. So I feel like that's been the most, consistent thing that's led to my success along with you know my faith um but having a strong support system to, to kind of remind me and my friends they remind me um and they're supportive as well so that's the biggest thing as part of me is my support system and just a minute ago we mentioned the triple crown and you were saying how everyone always brings that up as that has to have been one of your proudest moments and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. that team was really special and obviously there was so much talent on that team but the team itself there was just there was an energy around it that just felt like something special could be could happen and obviously it did what mm -hmm. was it that made that team so special i feel like what made the team special is that we well that ncaa team in that that year we had gone through so much leading up to Triple Crown um, just from making, I feel like it was more so trying not to be selfish throughout the year and us realizing that at the beginning of this, you know, cross country did what they had to do. And we were like, you know, we have to not be the, our own, our biggest, like our biggest um, downfall because at that one point we were going to be hurting ourselves and so I think once everyone was on board and realized that there was a bigger goal in mind, that history could be made, but we were the only ones stopping ourselves, that's when um, it just became where everyone kind of put their selfishness aside and it became a part, it became about accomplishing this bigger picture, something that could last forever. When you think about that time there, what's your favorite memory of your time at Oregon? I would say the culture at practice, it was a lot of fun. Um, just being amongst other hardworking individuals, but also having like a a playful environment to where we could like crack jokes on the coaches or on each other and not take offense. Um, I miss that. And then I would say just, I remember specifically, sorry, bottling us um, going to Penn and the culture that we kind of carried. So I feel like, the biggest part to sum this question is I really miss um, the culture that was associated with the name and the school and just the experience of going to Oregon. I am so sorry for that fire truck, but <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, that was the biggest thing. That was the biggest thing. And everybody knew that when we, you know, whether it was in the field events, whether it was in basketball and, you know, track and volleyball, whatever sport, there was a certain demeanor that was carried with the name, you know, and um, that was wherever you went. And that's, that's what I missed the most. Okay. Now you talked about earlier starting track at such a young age. So when you think back to when you started track so young, whether it's with wings track club mm -hmm. or even before that, what was it that got you started into track that attracted you to track? I played t-ball when I was younger and there was this like t-ball field that was you know along the way it's far away but in the in your peripheral you could see like all these like a track you could see a track and um I remember well I don't physically remember but just what I'm told from my mom it's just like well I remember playing um but I remember you know seeing all these kids running around having fun and 
uh, I think one day my mom was just like, let's just try it out. Because it was me and my friend. We were the only two girls on this boys t-ball team. And <laughs> so we went and tried it out. Um, I don't think my friend, I don't think she she made it through. <laughs> she didn't She didn't make it far. <laughs> um, but yeah, my mom, she just wants to try it out. And then I remember practicing and they saw that I didn't take it serious and whatnot. And I was like joke, like laughing, holding my friend's hands, wanting to run around track and play. Um, but then once my mom was like, oh, you know, maybe she shouldn't do this because it's not too, she's not taking it too serious. My grandfather kind of reassured her like, no, just keep her in it. You know, you'll figure it out. She'll get she'll get the hang of it. So that's kind of how it really started. It's like seeing all these children running around thinking it was fun. <laughs> thinking it was fun. <laughs> Um, but you know, yeah, it was better than T-ball at the time. <laughs> well, it's, it's still fun a little bit now, right? <laughs> no, it is fun. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. I don't want, I don't want to keep you for too much longer, but, uh, oh, yeah. one last question. And I was talking to Dev about this also. I'm very curious for all the Oregon athletes who are now will be coming back to the return of, of the new Hayward field. Mm-hmm. What do you expect it? to feel like coming back because you're not coming back to the same place but you're still coming back to Eugene I feel like it it makes it kind of okay so this is my thing after like traveling and being at these um Diamond League stadiums and all these championship stadiums I feel like Eugene is not going to change because it's the Eugene culture as well as the size. But having that stadium is going to, um, it's going to kind of be a monument for all of like the culture, all of the, um, the legacy that's kind of been, that made Hayward feel magical or makes Eugene track town USA, if you get what I'm saying. Like, mm-hmm. this is kind of what what will make it like, oh, this is the real deal. You know, this stadium, because it's something like a take us serious, this is a championship stadium. You know, this isn't, this. not saying Hayward Field wasn't a championship stadium. I feel like Hayward Field was more of a, um, a legacy. It was more of a, um, a historical monument. But this new stadium is more like a a stamp, like this is a certification, you know, like this is an actual serious place where track is taken really seriously. So that's how I see it. And I'm excited, um, especially because all the, from what I hear, just all of that's going to be put into it um, as, as far as all the history that will be told. So I don't feel like the history will ever, ever die and I remember saying that before I graduated was more so like what makes the legacy stay alive is the stories. So as long as people keep telling these stories about, you know, Prefontaine and they tell these stories about Haywood Phil, it makes it even more special because those people at these new stadium will wish they were there when Haywood Phil was there, you know, but now they'll have to kind of figure out the new stories that they can tell from here on out with this new stadium. So... Do you think it will be hard for athletes who are kind of coming up in at the University of Oregon to understand that history with the new stadium with without having experienced the original Hayward Field? Will that will that nostalgia kind of around it be gone? I don't think it will be gone. Um I don't think it will be gone just because the people in the community won't let it be gone. (laughs) They will not let it die. They won't. And that's the best part is even if they have to remind the newcomers of what they're a part of, you know, that's what helped me my freshman year transitioning into freshman year. And so that's what's going to help them stay humble and, you know, realize that it's bigger than just them, that you're a part of a culture is these people, these supporters, these runners, these figures in the community that have been here you know forever through all the transitioning and all the history that was made reminding the new people like hey we've been here and this is a big deal and you're a part of something special you know and that's kind of how it is then that's why it's best that people keep telling stories is because it reminds an individual that you're not at just any track meet this is bigger than just a track meet going on you're in a whole city that it's been a small city that has 
held a lot of records and a lot of history, you know? Absolutely. And it's not it's not really a lot of I feel like there aren't a lot of places that are like that in the US other than Penn that's kind of dedicated track in the in Milrose, like the armory. Um, mm-hmm. but definitely Eugene itself is kind of formed its own stadium to house all the history that was, you know, done. Awesome. Well, Ray, thank you so much for taking your time to come talk to me today. No I wish you nothing but the best on the upcoming season and your your road to road to Tokyo. Road uh, to Tokyo. <laughs> we'll be we will absolutely be watching for that. And thank you to everyone for listening and for, and to watching. Uh, I'll be back next week with another episode of Beyond the Uniform. Thank you. <laughs> this was Beyond the Uniform with TJ Brass. Join us again next week when Olympian Ariane Murphy and Olympic bronze medalist Clayton Murphy join the show.